everyone, Jade here. Today I'd like to introduce you to a new and exciting field of research. It's still quite speculative, but it's growing rapidly in popularity. It's called quantum biology, and it asks a very interesting question. Are there biological processes which need quantum mechanics to work? Now this question is surprising for a couple of reasons. Quantum processes generally need very specific conditions to work. When physicists explore quantum effects, they work in pristine conditions, usually at temperatures of near absolute zero with very expensive equipment in complete isolation. So it seems odd that these same processes take place in the hot, wet, messy world of life. But experiments over the past decade have shown mounting evidence that this is, in fact, the case. Quantum biology is also interesting because it brings together physicists and biologists. A friend of mine, Pat Kelly, who runs the biology channel called Corporis, actually came to me with this idea. Together, we've crafted a three-part mini-series which explores different instances of quantum biology. This first episode is about how plants may use quantum mechanics to perform perhaps the most important biological process on Earth, photosynthesis. On Pat's channel, we talk about how the engines that run our bodies, enzymes, may use a process called quantum tunneling. And finally, in the third episode, we talk about my favorite phenomenon, how some birds may use quantum entanglement to navigate the globe. So then, let's get started. How some plants may use quantum mechanics. The story starts in April 2007, where a group of MIT physicists were sharing science articles they'd found that week. One of the articles was suggesting that plants were mini quantum computers. The group exploded into laughter. The world's brightest minds had been trying to create a quantum computer for decades, and now it was being suggested that some dumb plant had outsmarted them. But as we'll soon see, they were foolish to laugh. First, let's talk about why someone would even make that claim. Plants as quantum computers? It does sound a bit far-fetched. Well, to understand this, we first need to understand a very old puzzle in biology. Why is photosynthesis so efficient? Pat can explain this much better than I can, so I'm gonna let him handle it. Life on Earth is only possible because of photosynthesis. You've heard of this phenomenon before. It's the synthesis of energy out of light, or photons. Trees do it, green algae do it, all kinds of plants do it all the time to produce over 15,000 tons of biomass every second. And even on such a big scale, photosynthesis comes down to just a chemical reaction. A plant or green algae takes carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight, and turns those ingredients into sugar, oxygen, and usable energy for the organism itself. Sunlight, along with the whole process of photosynthesis, happens in an organelle within plant cells called chloroplasts. Inside the chloroplast are stacks of discs called thylakoids that are filled with little green pigments called chlorophyll. To understand how sunlight goes from a photon to usable energy, we need a little background on the chemistry of chlorophyll. These molecules have a long carbon and oxygen backbone, with a big grid of carbon and nitrogen surrounding a lone magnesium atom. This makes it so magnesium has a single electron in its outermost layer that just barely hanging in there. So when a photon comes into the thylakoid, its energy knocks that electron off the magnesium. Here's where things get a little abstract. Usually we'd think of that magnesium ion as a whole as positively charged. It just lost an electron. But for all this to make sense, we need to reframe it a little bit. Think of it more like a neutral magnesium, a negative electron, and a positively charged hole where the electron used to be. This is called an exciton, and it can store energy. Those negative and positive poles make it work like a battery. But in order to make energy out of sunlight, the plant needs to get that exciton to a reaction center for a process called charge separation. This involves taking the electron from magnesium and transferring it to some nearby molecule so it can create a stable molecule. From there, the chemical process of photosynthesis can happen. But transferring that exciton is the hard part. Chloroplasts can transfer energy from chlorophyll to chlorophyll until it gets to a reaction center, but that might be really far away. Plus, chlorophyll are packed together super densely, so how does the exciton know which way to go? 
For years, we thought it randomly stepped from molecule to molecule until it landed at a reaction center. But if that were the case, the excitons were more likely to get lost than to perform photosynthesis. And that was kind of a problem because in the real world, photosynthesis happens with nearly 100% efficiency. Almost zero electrons ever get lost. And that's more efficient than any human technology we've ever come up with. Plus, classical chemistry couldn't explain how such an efficient process was possible. This is a long-standing puzzle in biology, and the article that the MIT physicists were all laughing at was suggesting that plants use quantum mechanical effects to get around this. See, one of the main ideas in quantum mechanics is called superposition, and it's the idea that a particle can be in more than one place at a time. In the macroscopic world we're accustomed to, if something is in one spot, it definitely can't be in any other spot. But in the quantum world, things aren't so straightforward. A single particle can simultaneously exist in many different places with different probabilities. It's kind of like if you have a hedgehog in a box and you have to guess where it is. You might say there's a 70% chance it's where the food is, a 20% chance it's on the bed, and a 10% chance it's on the treadmill. These probabilities represent the likelihood of finding the hedgehog when you take a look. But the thing is, the hedgehog isn't really in all of these places. It's only in one. You just don't know which. But quantum particles are different. Before they're measured, they really are in all places at once with different probabilities. We can view these probabilities as a spread out wave. At every point in space, there's a different probability of finding the particle there. An important point is this probability wave only remains intact before it's detected. As soon as it's measured, it collapses into a single particle at one location. Yeah, there's a reason quantum mechanics has a reputation for being weird. Now this idea of being in many places at once can be extended to taking many paths at once. If a particle reaches a fork in the road, it doesn't need to choose, it can take both. If it's presented with many paths, it can take all of them, like a wave spreading out over space. This is exactly what the paper was proposing, that the exciton takes all possible paths to the reaction center, and that's how it gets there so quickly. This explanation actually kind of makes sense when you think about it. So why were all the quantum physicists laughing their heads off? Well, the biggest enemy of all quantum processes is something called decoherence. Remember how we talked about how the superposition only lasts until a particle is measured? Well, in quantum talk, measured doesn't mean the same thing that it means in everyday language. Here, measured means when this wave particle comes into contact with anything else, like another particle, a molecule, anything. When it's in this wave state, it's said to be in a state of coherence. When it's broken or measured, this is decoherence. Decoherence is the reason physicists need to work in such specific conditions when they're dealing with quantum mechanical effects. In the macroscopic world we're used to, there are so many particles and molecules bouncing around, so much jostling and wiggling due to the heat, that coherence doesn't last long enough to be detected. This is why we don't see quantum mechanical effects in our day-to-day -day lives. It's also one of the main struggles with the creation of quantum computers. Physicists come up with all kinds of clever and expensive ways to shield their precious particles from the evils of the outside world, cooling them to near absolute zero temperatures and attempting to keep them in complete isolation. But so far, nothing has worked to keep decoherence at bay. And now this paper was suggesting that plants could ward off decoherence at normal temperatures and conditions? It didn't make sense. The MIT physicists sent one of their members, Seth Lloyd, to investigate this claim. What he came back with surprised everyone. Let's take a look at this paper which caused such a stir. An experiment was performed at the University of California, Berkeley, using a technique with the very impressive name of two-dimensional Fourier transform electron spectroscopy the research team was able to probe into the inner structure of a photosynthetic complex. They fired three successive pulses of laser light into it, which generated a light signal which was then picked up by a detector. If there really was coherence among the excitons, they should be able to see interference between the different pathways, a so-called quantum beat. The leading author on the paper, Greg Engel, 
spent the entire night stitching together the data and found exactly what he was looking for. A rising and falling signal, like the interference pattern produced when waves interfere. In other words, this quantum beat showed that the exciton wasn't taking a single route through the chlorophyll maze, but was following multiple routes simultaneously. This was a huge shock to the scientific community. The MIT physicists were forced to admit that they may have laughed too soon. Numerous experiments have been performed since then, confirming this result. However, the story is far from over. Although this quantum beat keeps showing up, there's still debate over how to interpret it. Some experts in the field think that the beats are caused by molecular vibrations, not coherence. Others think the observed coherence was too small in amplitude to have originated in excitons, and then there are others who think that this quantum beat is in fact direct evidence for quantum biological processes. Let's just say there are mixed vibes. Research is still going on to understand how photosynthesis is so efficient, and may lead to insights to create quantum computers and other technologies. Quantum biology is an amazing area of research, rich with possibilities. This video was about the biological processes that plants use, but what about the processes that govern our own bodies? In the next part of this series over on Pat's channel, we'll see how a quantum biological process may be responsible for the engines that run our own bodies, enzymes. I've linked to it in the description. Make sure to check it out and subscribe to Pat while you're over there. I will see you in the next episode of Up and Atom, where we talk about how birds may use quantum entanglement to navigate the globe. As always, a huge thank you to all my patrons on Patreon who help make these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.